So I almost didn't get an opportunity to do one of these this week. I had an interesting uh, little adventure with uh, my old computer, which I was hoping it was 2014 is how old it was. I was kind of hoping it would hold up until right around November, December when I was had a half a plan to get a new computer, but uh, the other day I logged in, half the websites would work, the ones owned by Google, the major websites like, you know, YouTube and a few others, uh, but other websites wouldn't work at all. I did all the troubleshooting steps. I went to uh, flush the DNS system, they call it, squeaky chair, flush the DNS system as they called it, uh, reset the reset the IP stack. Uh, I did everything known that I knew to do with it. And then I called uh, my internet service provider and I stayed on the phone with the with the tech lady for, I think it was like two and a half hours after I had been on hold for 45 minutes. And they worked, walked me through every single step, uh, everything possible. And uh, <laughs> nothing could be done about it. I ended up having to finally give it up and get a new computer, which was a whole nother adventure in itself. But uh, that's why I, I didn't have one up for Thursday. But uh, I had a half a mind to talk about another topic uh, this week when I when I was going to start this, but there was a discussion going on online, and I won't go into detail about uh, the the individual's personal plights that they were talking about with their own toxic family members and, and things of that nature, but it got me to thinking in depth about something that's been kind of playing around on my mind for quite some time now, and I had a uh, I, every time I tried to kind of formulate an idea how to talk about it, it just seemed so scattered and so out of, you know, there was, it was, a, it was a several things I wanted to kind of tie in together all at once, <clears throat> and I just wasn't sure how, so I'm going to attempt that in this one rather than the other topic that I had planned for this week, but uh, one thing that, uh, that was being mentioned, and I, I, and I guess without going into their own personal details, I'll just talk about my own, is that there's one thing I've, I've always wanted to try to give voice to. I've kind of hinted at it before in other videos, but the stigma of being labeled an alcoholic and an addict, uh, or the stigma of, of being labeled the addicted person, uh, you know, I've said it many times in other videos that when you, when you, when you have that label attached to you, a lot of people use it as a license for cruelty, and a lot of uh, people use it as a license to treat you any kind of way they want to, and they use it as an excuse to hold your past against you for the rest of your natural life. Uh, you know, I've talked before about there's a lot of people uh, in my own family that I can't live with, that I can't be around as a result of it. Uh, even now, and I'm not going to go too deep into too much detail about it, but even now, even though I haven't done any drinking and drugs in a very long time, uh, just the dynamics, the, the, the sick dynamics of the entire thing is just too much for me. But I found it was, it was necessary for me uh, to cut loose of a lot of people, just like I cut loose of the AA cult religion. But I was thinking in general about the fact that uh, when I did have a problem with drinking, when, when my problem was getting pretty bad, and I said, you know, I got to do something about this. Uh, can't keep going the way I was going. It's funny, my drinking didn't get really severely out of control until after I had been in AA. I didn't end up in a drug court program until I had been uh, in AA for about five or six years. Uh, but it, it, it was something that I was thinking about that when I got to AA, everybody already assumed they knew what was wrong with me. Everybody was telling me, you know, well, your problem is you don't do this. Well, you need to do this. Well, you're selfish. Well, you're this. Well, you're that. You know, I've kind of gone through the 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 whole plethora of, of judgment, judgmental uh, accusations you get flung at you the minute you walk through the door as to what's wrong with you. And I and I was and I was thinking about uh, you know you, you you see professionals. I didn't get to see any professionals early on. I didn't get to see professionals until I was court ordered in AA and forced to see some court ordered professionals, uh, along with uh, you know the judgments of my own family members and everything. Everybody was always telling me what my problem was and what I needed to do, and, and you know they were all telling me what a failure I was, what a fuck up I was, uh, and on and on and on and on. But nobody ever ever seemed to kind of have an attitude in it, uh, of uh, 
you know, maybe somebody ought to ask the guy, me, uh, what he thinks about the situation or what he's feeling about the situation. It didn't occur to me until much later uh, to think about it in those terms, and this is where I'm going to start getting all over the place, so <clears throat> I'll try not to wander. But it occurred to me that, uh, that nobody ever took a moment to ask me what my outlook was on the situation or why I might have been doing the things I was doing. Now, I'm going to, uh, to use a football term here, even though I'm not a sports fan, I'm going to head them off at the pass because this is always the part where the AA old timers would always say, well, we're not here to baby you, we're not here to hold your hand, we're not in kindergarten, you know, if you, if you want to go to a kindergarten or you need to say it, you know, all that other kind of bullshit. But <clears throat> it occurred to me that doing this whole judgmental, intolerant type of behavior towards somebody uh, in of itself has never been that helpful in some ways. You know, I talked before on here about uh, I'm not really a big fan of comedy. I'm not a really uh, the kind of person that really does a whole lot of laughing, but that the BBC British radio program, The Going Show, uh, had me rolling around laughing in tears late one night when I was listening to the old audio recordings of it. And it, it got me curious enough about it uh, that, uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm not wandering, I, I, you'll see what I'm trying to come up with here in a second, but uh, there was three guys that did the going show. There was a Harry Seacombe, he was from Wales. Uh, he was a trained opera singer. He was, in general, when I read about his autobiographies and stuff online, he was pretty much an ordinary guy, but he was also a real nice guy. He didn't have uh, anything major uh, too badly in his life. There was Peter Sellers. Uh, a lot of people know him from the Pink Panther, if you remember that, was in the 70s, although he, his movies were not so much to my liking, but his talents were, were very great, as far as the Goon Show especially. He did the voices of like nine different characters. Uh, then you had Spike Milligan, who was uh, the main creator and writer behind it all. Now, Spike Milligan uh, ended up in and out of mental hospitals pretty much most of his, most of his life. Uh, lived a very tormented, unhappy existence, uh, and everybody wrote him off as manic in many of the interviews I saw about him when I was reading about it, and it's kind of what gave me an idea for this video. Uh, there were so many family members later on that were saying, well, we didn't know a whole lot about the problem in those days. You know, we didn't understand uh, what he probably, you know, he was probably just bipolar, and we didn't understand that back in those days, but they pretty much shifted him off to one mental asylum after the other. In fact, his memories of the going show was quite bittersweet. He said, uh, you know, I, I appreciated that it was so popular that even the Prince Charles of England was a huge fan of ours, and one major cricket team in England <laughs> uh, set aside a game and did a little skit in our honor and everything, but it's very bittersweet to me because I ended up in the mental hospital four or five times while I was trying to write that thing. I had several manic episodes where I lost control of myself, and, uh, you know, it was very, very grating on me. Uh, <clears throat> comedian Peter Sellers was a a very deeply unhappy man. In fact, at one point in his life, it was almost sad to me. He died very young, uh, young by my standards. He was only 50 uh, or maybe 49, something like that. But he had said that the Goon Show was the only time in his whole entire existence that he had ever experienced any happiness of any kind. In fact, uh, right before he died, he was trying to reorganize the Goons again. And uh, uh, in interviews and stuff like that, there was a lot of cruelty that he did. There was a lot of crazy shit that he did. He even said there is no real Peter Sellers. There's just a, a bunch of roles that I play and I accumulate them. There's no real me. In later interviews, people were talking about, you know, by today's standards, uh, we know a whole lot more about what the guy went through. Uh, you know, you could have been treated, but, you know, it, it got me to thinking about it. And I'm not saying that psychiatry, and I'm not saying that medicine in and of itself is an absolute authority. You know, I had some cult members uh, that were trying to tell me, well, you just substituted the absolute authority of God in AA for doctors and psychiatry. No, I, I, I really have not. I mean, I'm not saying that if they had understood those mental illnesses that these, these two guys suffered with as severely as they did, if they had known a little bit more about it, there's a possibility they could have treated them. There's a possibility the psychiatric institutions and the psychologists could make you a whole lot worse. I'm still going to try to tie this together here, so just bear with me for a minute. Um, but I remember uh, my own father, uh, before he got sick with cancer, towards the end of his life, uh, he was a very deeply unhappy man. He was 
prone to major depressions. Uh, he had a lot of anxiety. He had a lot of worry. Uh, and like I've said before, it's, it's it's one of those things that, you know, we were on bad terms uh, when he finally passed away, unfortunately, because we were like, we were more like drinking buddies than we were father and son. Same thing with my grandfather. But uh, I remember one time when he was tied up into the, the VA system and he was tied up with all these doctors and he was tied up with all the family members that later on, I'll get to this in a second, but uh, in one of his private moments when it was just he and I, he said, you know, Part of the problem I, that I've got right now in this in this life in this world is, if I had just listened to myself and not listened to everybody else, I think I'd be okay. You know, I mean, he said I wasn't hurting anybody coming home every night drinking and drinking. Uh, you know, which I can back him up on this. I'd like to say because uh, I never saw he was never violent. He was never abusive. Uh, he never was really much of a difference when he was drinking or not drinking. I mean, he, he would come home, he would watch the news, he would watch movies, he we would, you know, those kinds of things. I never really noticed a major shift, a, a Jekyll Hyde type situation with him, but he, yeah, he liked to drink. He liked to drink heavy. Uh, somewhere along the way, you know, the, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of personal information, but first, you know, the, the, the intolerant members of my own household, they wanted him to you know, the, you know, you've forsaken the assembly of God and the church and all of that. So he got tied up with a bunch of them. And then they ended up getting sent to a bunch of uh, doctors in the VA hospital. I, it, it was lucky he never ended up in Quackaholics Anonymous. But, you know, he got put through the medical ringer and put on all kinds of medications that made him even more depressed and more neurotic and a whole bunch of other things. And I remember him saying, I wasn't hurting nobody drinking. You know, I wished I had I had stopped listening to everybody, and I had just uh, you know I had just listened to myself. And uh, towards the end, I remember after uh, he had gotten cancer and after he was eat up with it, I remember he looked at me one day and he said, "You know, my whole entire life I've always been afraid to die, and uh, I'm going to die pretty soon, and I'm actually rather relieved of it. I'll never have to deal with this misery any longer." You know, it was. It was an unbearably tragic thing. It's you know, if I got to talking about it too long, I'd, I'd yeah, I'd probably start getting emotional about it. But I remember one period in my life when I was first introduced in AA and I was starting to relapse and things were starting to fall apart and you know all this shit was happening to me. I remember waking up one morning. It was over at a family member's house. I had passed out. I was you know intoxicated. I was drunk the night before. I hadn't really made a scene or anything, but uh, I could hear people in the next room, uh, people related to me in the next room, and they were all discussing me uh, like I was some kind of case or something. I remember, I didn't think of it in those terms at the time. I was too freaking miserable. I was shaking even back then a little bit that morning. It wasn't as severe as later on, but I remember the only thing I was happy about was I had a bottle hidden in the room that they didn't know about that I could, you know, kill my hangover with, but they were all talking, and it was, you know, he's just a... He's just a loser like his father and his grandfather. He's just a failure like his father and his grandfather. And I was thinking, you know, you can really sum up a guy in, in a couple of sentences like that. Just a loser like his father and his grandfather. You know, uh, my grandfather and grandfather, I mean, my grandfather and father were eccentric guys. They weren't ever uh, what you would call as far as... Uh, mainstream type society or imagery of the mainstream types of society they didn't quite fit into the societal mold of what normal would be uh but they were very generous men they were very kind men they had their issues they had their problems they weren't perfect people by any means shape form or fashion but it, it, i remember it was just pissing me off uh to be sitting there on the edge of the bed trying to kill this hangover and being told you know he's just a loser like they were well you know before you write somebody off as a fucking hopeless loser and before you send them off into some freaking cult uh, that's going to tell them what all's wrong with them and how everything that they've ever done in life is all their fault, uh, did you ever consider or did you ever think about the fact that maybe, just maybe, uh, you could consider maybe what the guy, you know, who's doing, who's suffering with the addiction, what they may be going through, you know? <laughs> Nobody ever asked me how I ever felt when I went into AA. The only time they would ask me how I would feel would be so I could tell them what was going on with me, so I could tell them what I felt like, so I could tell them what I was going through, only for them to turn that around into sneering, harsh, condescending, condescending, judgmental bullshit 
about what's wrong with you. Well, you don't do this. Well, you don't do this. Well, you don't do this. Well, you you did this one time. You did that one time. You know, it was, uh, it, and it was the same thing uh, when, it, when it was a struggle uh, with my old family members to try to put my life back together. It was always a constant bringing, you know, anytime there was an argument, anytime there was a disagreement, every anytime that they did anything dirty or anything wrong, there was always that one little thing they could fall back on. Well, you're the drunk, not us. You know, you're the one who got the DUIs. You're the one who, uh, you know, you remember the time you did this. Do you remember the time you passed out and fell down in front of everybody? Do you remember that time that, you know, you fell down when you were going to the bathroom and you peed on yourself? You know, you you know, you're you're the fucking drunk. You're the fuck. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. I get it. I get. I did all that. I'm not proud of it. But it just seemed like a really convenient club to beat me with whenever they were doing something that was uh, what I felt was in the wrong, you know. Uh, I, I never will forget a certain cousin of mine that was like, you know, this, this is Christmas coming up. There's a Christmas coming up. and you Don't don't you dare fuck it up. Don't show up at a drunk and fuck it all up. Now, I sat there during that little Christmas gathering. And all I could do is wait to get out of there so I could get home and get me get to me a bottle. And I watched him getting plastered, and I watched him getting wasted, and I watched him turn the radio up way too fucking loud, and I watched him do all kinds of shit, and I watched everybody else just kind of acting like, you know, hey, it's no big deal, it's Christmas. Everybody gets drunk on Christmas while well, they got drunk, and I'm sitting there sober, and I'm sitting there depressed, and I'm sitting there wishing I could just go blow my brains out. And I'm thinking about the only thing I really want to do is get out of this fucking house so I can go get me a bottle of booze and forget about all of this. But nobody ever even thought about entertaining uh, the idea or the notion of, you know, what does the world look like to the guy that you've labeled an alcoholic and a drug addict? What, what does the world look like to the people out here that are that are hiding bottles all over their houses, that are drinking themselves to death in order to try to cope with the reality of the situation they're living in. Does anybody ever ask these people maybe what they're going through or, or, or what they're thinking or what they're feeling? Because I never, I've never honestly in all of my years of dealing with professionals and, and treatment center specialists and crackaholics and weirdo fucking AA sponsors and all of that, I don't think I've ever actually seen anybody do anything but put a bunch of uh, put a bunch of prescriptions uh, in front of you of you know you need to do this well you need to do that well you know I know you I know you work all the time and you pay all your bills but you, you know that's not good enough you're not good enough because you're a drunk and you'll always be a drunk and just don't forget the fact that you're always a loser and you're always a drunk and you'll always continue to be a drunk even if you don't drink for thirty fucking years you'll still be a drunk you know even if you uh, became a millionaire and then did a great service to all of mankind we know what you're really like you're a drunk or a drunk you will always be a drunk. You were a loser like your father and your grandfather. I mean, it occurred to me that the way that the entire uh, field of addiction is set up, it hasn't evolved one bit. You know, back to what I was talking about at the beginning of the video, you know, with, with a guy like my, uh, Spike Milligan or a Peter Sellers or even a Joey Ramon. I don't, I, I, you know, this, is, this has caused me to say I, I, I think I ought to do a video about my struggles with OCD and addiction and see if anybody else out here has had that same problem. But I remember hearing about Joey Ramon going up and down the stairs, uh, checking locks on his doors, checking locks on his, on his ovens and everything. And the other uh, Ramones were saying, this guy's fucking with us. This guy's just doing this on purpose. They were shitty as hell to him as a result of it. And uh, you know, Marky Ramon later on was sitting on uh, the, an interview and he said, if only we had known what OCD was in those days. Nobody understood. I didn't know what OCD was during the time I was suffering with it. I didn't know anything about it at all. I'm saying that the field of addiction is still treating people with these outdated concepts of from way back in the 1930s. Uh, and, and has not made any progress in the, in the psychological world whatsoever to where we're still being stuck in that same old outdated way of, of you know, this guy's an addict, well, it's a moral failing, it's a spiritual problem, it's a physical and mental illness, but we're going to treat him like shit for his own good until he wakes up and does what we want him to do. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know if I actually articulated everything I wanted to say about that, but I, I was getting a lot of feedback from some people that were telling me about how their own family members beat them over the head with their addictions and how their own family members beat them over the head with their their past behaviors and they hold it against them 
for the rest of their lives. I did want to close, though, on one on one lighthearted thing since I've talked for 20 minutes now. It, uh, I was reading a thing online uh, not too long ago, and I think uh, viewers and subscribers will find this uh, amusing. There was a guy on board the Titanic. Uh, when the ship was going down, he was a baker. And uh, as a baker, for some reason, while everybody was running around and panicking and screaming, I'll, I'll have to look his name up because I, I don't, it just eludes me right now when I'm making this. I didn't know I was going to tell the story until I did it. Uh, but he just kept baking bread when the Titanic was going down. He just said, well, you know, we can get bread to the people on the lifeboats and they'll have something to eat until they get picked up by the rescue people. So he just kept baking loaves of bread and he kept giving people loaves of bread as they were getting on the, on the lifeboats. Uh, Later on, when it was time for him to try to get on a lifeboat, there was only one spot for him, and he just said, well, give it to one of these women or kids, you know, I'll just go back to the kitchen and I'll just keep baking and keep giving people food until I get, you know, uh, the whatever. Well, once there was no need to bake any longer, once the water was starting to come in on the Titanic, he just started drinking. <laughs> started drinking a lot of booze, according to what I was reading, so... While he was drinking, he went upstairs and he grabbed chairs and other heavy items and he threw them off the Titanic into the water. And he was yelling for people to swim to those things and grab onto them that they could use them like life rafts. Uh, he kept doing that and he kept drinking whiskey and he kept drinking more liquor until the Titanic was really about to go. He, he jumped off the Titanic into the freezing cold water. He swam to a boat, a lifeboat that didn't have no place for him. So he swam away, and he swam to another lifeboat. I don't remember how many lifeboats he went through, but he somehow managed to miraculously survive the entire ordeal. And later on, when he was asking life about, you know, how did he survive the freezing cold water, he said, I, I, drank so much, I drank so much alcohol and liquor that I think I just, you know, it made me immune from the freezing cold weather because I was able to tread water in the water all night long until I was finally picked up. He later on went to join the army and he served in the First World War and was kind of a heroic guy. So if anybody ever tells you that alcohol never did anything good for nobody, just think about that guy. If I find his name, I'll post it in the comment section below if anybody's interested. Until next time, uh, 